in fact, I would like only to discuss in a way, but I've prepared my lecture and I think I have to stick to it, so I will, but perhaps afterwards we can continue because I'm very interested in this theme and actually it has marked my personal uh, change in my career from being architect to being urban designer and landscape designer at the moment. And that had very much to do with the fact that I felt restrained in the fact that the architect often comes too late in the process. And in the urban design, you are more free to understand how the, you can organize the project and what about program you want to make there. But to summarize, on the other hand, uh, we don't want to design to an end. I understood your opinion very clearly, but beauty lasts long. So in the end, it's also all the effort to preserve things because we have become in love with it. And this is not only because we like the program, but sometimes only also the sheer beauty of it. So perhaps I have made some ground for my lecture <laughs> again. Um, I'm born son of two uh, restoration architects and I was raised in this uh, house in the little city of Horen, like Leeuwarden. And um, the office was on the two top stories of a pack house, as we call it, as a storage house. Tall people could not enter, they always had to walk like this in the house. So um, I was grown up in a reused situation. The thing is that uh, when I started to understand what their profession was, profession was, I started to understand that I was perhaps living in a sort of a, um, lie. Well, that's a big word, but the house used to be look, looking like this. And it was not uh, after my parents came. No, it was my parents who made this illusion out of it. Um, turned out that not only they made the illusion, also the houses next to our house and the other side and the other side, actually the half the street was an illusion it turned out, it turned out to be. Okay, and here my parents are somewhere halfway of their reconstruction. And so my talk is a little bit about reconstruction, what it gives you and what risks it, it, it can give you. Um, but we try, or I try to uh, design in such a way that you can always see um, what the comment should be about on the building. So if I'm not there and my, parents, my children are not there, can your design still comment on what your improvement or adaption uh, was and why you did it? And to show this kind of uh, um, longer research I do over different projects, I have a few examples and I have to take care not to talk too long. So I will speed up. Um, this was a project I did, I was 14 years a partner in the German office of Rapp and Rapp, and we were asked to make this uh, um, town hall three times bigger. It was recessed from the corner facing a church, a typical Carlo Cite uh, environment, you might say, a typical Euro a European inner city location. We were forced or asked to make the program bigger. This was just a question. This is where we could start with our design. And um, we tried to make the half house that was off a corner into a corner house, but be able to uh, show the comment we did to the to the we gave to the to the building. So this is uh, the volumetric extension. You can see it's much bigger, and we adapted the roof from thick to thinner to even thinner to let the snake bite in its own tail. This created such a condition that we could fill up all the space to the corner and make the urban design ready or finished or appropriate. It is also uh, a good thing in urban design that you have a feel that something has come to rest, to, to an end, to, that, you, that you can continue with your life and not have this con continuous question in the corner. But we had a question how to deal with the architecture. We, re we liked the re new renaissance of the former town hall and uh, we thought we are only an extension, we are not making something new, and we want to keep relevance to the original building. So we started to com comment on the building, and by going around the corner and the other corner and the next corner, we were able to bite, to let the snake bite in its own tail, and uh, the, the, 
if it works, the facade shows uh, in what way we copied and invented on the themes of this neo-Renaissance uh, architecture. In another uh, building, we did something uh, in another way. We found out we were forced to building uh, and when we went into the archives we discovered actually there was it was a freestanding building with a fantastic facade to a small street it's near the it's near the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam it's a very wealthy area and we thought it cannot be that we uh, are not able to show this for the future uh, so we tried to convince the people who built against that beautiful building to take it away again, but this was of course an illusion. And then we had to think, okay, what to do next? So we were um, asked to make housing of this uh, former um, uh, telephone uh, communications building, old building, uh, by taking away the backside entry part of it. And in our comments to the building and uh, as, a, as a trial to keep memory of that very important building next to it that was also on the list to be demolished and is already taken out of sight all the time. We designed a facade similar to the one next to it. Okay, then I moved from uh, architecture more to uh, West 8. Uh, this was because of a project uh, called the Waterlinie Museum in uh, Fort, by Fort, Fort by Vechten by Utrecht. I will end with that project. Uh, but to give a small uh, introduction, uh, this is a project on uh, the Bonnepolder. It's a very old landscape near Rotterdam, the Hoek, Hoek van Holland. And this is the Krukiuskaart at 1712. It's still hanging there in the um, Delftland um, waterschap in Delft. Really beautiful map, very precise, incredibly precise. And on it, it's already marked the Bonnepolder. I don't have a picture of this area at the moment, but I can tell you it's totally industrialized and what is not industry has become glass houses. So it's filled with property and it's like uh, Asterix and Obelix little village in, uh, in France. This Bonnepolder is the last standing free space. I'm very happy that I'm now in the position, not as an architect, but more as a landscape designer, to be able to see how to protect this, uh, this property. I'm from the polder, then from the north of the no North Holland, but this is also polder, actually very ancient polder. Um, the dike next to the area is from 1200. But how to preserve um, agricultural space uh, that um, in a way has no value uh, for people who think about square meters and square meter prices. And then came um, a party who wants to make natuurbegraven here. It's a new form of burial, burial grounds. Um, but we have a law. You cannot do this, you know, underwater because then you will not rot. So how to make in the polder, which is lowland, a rotting area. So um, then um, history came to help again, and we found out that next to this large area, it's a huge, huge area. Um, um, around 1900, uh, the Van Rijkenforsel family um, took away a bit of the um, dunes and started to make a forest. So the forest was, in a way, a later introduction to the area. So we took that uh, same trick and um, added a piece of wood for the new function and this new function can pay for the maintenance uh, of all that large area in the future time. Okay, now for the Vechten. Uh, some might know it as a, <clears throat> as a building. Actually, I did the project for 10 years and it's mostly a landscape project. Um, this is a scale, it's 17 acres big um, beautiful building has been built in the middle of it by Anne Holtrop, and this has got some attention last years. I want to talk about that beautiful building. I will talk about something else. <laughs> it's about the new Honse Waterlinie, and the building or the area had to be the entry to, the, to this new Honse Waterlinie. 
and um, it was developed in the time where uh, already was mentioned Bahadur ontwikkeling or preservation by development was taking a, a new uh, swing for uh, reuse uh, of monuments and, and uh, a property. But we saw many of exam uh, examples that we didn't particularly like. The, was the cure better than uh, the disease was the question, and these are all forts in the Netherlands that were reused by development. Our question was, and it was already decided before we came into the project, can you make the gate to the World Heritage Site, the New Holland Savate Linie, it's 85 kilometers long, and uh, our question was, can you make a museum or a convention center or something to mark this? And this was a terrible question because the scale is so big that you cannot, how can you tell something of 85 kilometers? Then the moment came, and I was at that moment working with the architect Rap and Rap, but we did the commission together with uh, Adrian Geuze from West Aid, and together we made the design. And when we found out this drawing where we could see the nervous um, notations by the lieutenant having to adopt his fort for the coming war, I understood this piece of landscape, in fact, is the machine. And that triggered the idea that we might make not a building, but we might the whole fort as a, as a museum, an outdoor museum. Well, the original condition was, of course, very open with only camouflage trees, but the way the moment we came, it was like this. The um, commissioners were state staats bosbeheer, so owning large, large uh, areas of forest, uh, the uh, Utrecht province, and the uh, project bureau New Hollandse Waterlinie had uh, to put attention to this Hollandse Waterlinie. The, the one wanted to keep all the trees, the other wanted to take all trees away. Um, so we came after some discussion with this solution uh, to do both, and we uh, created this 80 to 45 reconstruction area where we show the fortress as it was, and the rest we kept into a state that we found it. Um, we had a European uh, uh, subsidy on the project was of 17 million dollars, uh, euros, and that was it. So we had a circle around the project for all things we wanted to do, restoration, consolidation, nature, new functions, uh, uh, money for the advisors, etc. And so, um, we had a devices scheme where we could uh, maintain and restore and explain, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is uh, how it turned out. Uh, we quite radically formed this strategy, followed this strategy, and the contrast between the reconstructed areas and the leftover, we only consolidated, help you wonder what has happened and what is happening here. And it takes onto a platform all the beautiful elements of this fort and how it is uh, sit, uh, made of, how it is made. It is situated in such a way that it uh, touches all elements that are there only one time, because it's a 19th century fort, it is totally symmetrical. But we shifted its orientation of this uh, zone to mark that it was not originally there, because I'm afraid that perhaps people might st start thinking in 100 years that this was always the case. So that's why we shifted off the symmetry line of the 19th century hard. We did, of course, extensive res research in how this earthen landscape used to be, because it was all worn out over the 150 years of use. You can see it in the height measurements that were taken. We did endless amounts of drawing to make the geometry right again with cross-referencing how it was, and then we went bulldozing, because in many times when it was used during wartime, it had, had adaptions. But of course, nature is very strong, and we uh, had to stay as it was, uh, keep some important trees, keep later additions, and so you can see how we try to integrate both of them. We did a research into nature, because it was originally planted, what was it? How do you deal with original planting, and the new planting and the in-between planting. Well, some discussions on reconstruction. Uh, I will end with some pictures. I have five seconds left. This is the result. Thank you very much. Okay.